Thank you very much. Is this on? Is this on? Let's have a look. I think it's on. Okay, brilliant. Perfect. Hello. I'm Sam Bompus. Is, is um, uh, Beth Adams here? Can you put your hand up? No? Oh, um, hello, Beth. Um, I don't know if you could step down to the front. There's been a little jelly emergency, which I could do with some... It's not a dire jelly emergency, a little jelly emergency. There's always, um, there's, always some, there's always some magic and mystery when you're wangling jelly, especially in a very hot environment, which means that it's an exciting race against time between the jelly melting and you getting it at the perfect temperature. Um, which brings me on to my next question, which is, um, has everyone got a spoon in front of them? Yes, hopefully. If, you've, if you haven't got a spoon in front of you, um, put your hand up and um, we'll, we'll, we'll get one to you. Um, immediately. Um, so, come on, come on, come on. Okay. So, I managed to get the jellies quite close. They're just outside that door through there. And if they come onto the trolley there, then we can sort of wheel it dramatically on stage. Just come, just come straight. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, we better start. That's it. No more, no more time wasting. Thank you very much, Beth. So we'll, 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 the jellies will emerge any minute now, and then we can, and then we can get stuck in. The fees can commence. We've, we've not, it's going to be a bit one bite as well. It's not going to be masses. There's quite a lot of you here today. Um, but I, I assure you, it's a very good bite. Um, so they're, they're just, just through there. Keep, keep going. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Um, OK, anyway, sorry. Um, I'm Sam Bompus, one half of Bompus and Par. We do things like whiskey tornadoes, breathable clouds of gin and tonic. Um, that was a chocolate waterfall, um, kind of disgusting. Um, feasting for thousands of people at a time. Um, and most recently, our most recent project was we did the New Year's Eve fireworks for London, um, where we had, um, as, as the fireworks went up in the sky, so these were all sort of uh, red ones, so you could taste strawberries, um, and, then, and then it got even better. You could, uh, you could have, um, this was a peach snow that came down. Um, I think there's some people, their mouths open, um, having a sort of a total sensory um, assault. Um, and, uh, but, but we like, but, but, so this is really exciting, but actually, where it all started was jelly. And tonight, what I'm going to do, um, race against the clock, is give you all our jelly secrets, um, expounds a little bit on, basically, we're, we're really rubbish at jelly to start with, but it was a cruel task, mistress, and um, we learned some very hard lessons, which were um, pretty intense at times. Um, but I'm going to give you the benefit of those lessons and our total culinary philosophy, which you can then take away for most triumphant dinner parties, epic feasting, um, and being a total inspiration for all your friends as well. So all the secrets in 15 minutes. Um, and if I don't give them, come grab me in the foyer over a glass of wine and I'll tell you whatever else you want to know. Um, we started out seven years ago, and it's me, Harry Parr, um, my little sister, she's a barrister, and we wanted to get a stall at Borough Market on the weekend. Now, um, we sat down, we thought, oh, we know like, all, the, all the foods at Borough Market are quite savoury, there's no really good sweet stuff, and after you have one of those enormous chorizo sandwiches, what you really want is something really light and tasty. We thought... Jelly held the key. The problem was, Borough Market didn't think so. Um, and so there was an immediate setback because we sent all the stuff across to them and they said, get lost. Um, but we, we still thought then that, that jelly, there was something in jelly. We wanted to do it really um, beautifully and really specially. And are they on the trolley? It's okay. This is, a good, this is a good time. Thank you very much. Cheers. Um, so. Here we go. So, so with jellies, it's always a challenge. Um, there should be some rather glorious jellies in there. Um, one's not made it. Um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll get on to them presently and the, t the techniques that they, that they display. Um, anyway, so, so at the time, um, uh, Abra dropped out. She's a barrister. She's very serious. We had very sticky floors, a lot of enormous gastronomic kitchens in 
um, her front room. Um, so she was less human. So we didn't speak for a year, but we're speaking again now. Um, but, um, but basically, uh, this is the first thing we ever did. It's a village innocent fate uh, VNP area. And you can't quite see, but they're just the jellies we're using, Tupperwares. We couldn't really afford molds at the time. We wanted those beautiful antique copper molds that, that you might have seen on sort of the Martha Stewart show or something as a lovely decorative thing. People, people don't really use them, um, except for our food hero, Ivan Day. Um, we couldn't afford any of them. Um, and so we decided, Harry was trained to be an architect. It's much more glamorous than me. Um, I studied geography. Um, and, <laughs> and so uh, we, we decided to make our own. And he found out that all those things that he had been learning to um, create uh, buildings, uh, so CAD design and 3D printing, we could actually use for the very serious purpose of designing jellies. Um, and so this is the first one we ever did, is St. Paul's Cathedral. Um, and it, looks like, it looked like that. It was brilliant. It was really good. Um, and all you do is you, you, you CAD model it, 3D print it, which is pretty straightforward now, but back, it, back then it was, it was a lot trickier. Um, and then use that as your, as your tool to make as many St. Paul's cathedrals as you like. Um, and then you've just got to make the jelly as well. Um, but at the time, we didn't really know, um, you know, we had a bit of a challenge because we, 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 we knew we wanted to do jellies like this, but we hadn't, we hadn't really mastered the art of like what were the different parameters, how far could we push this sort of molded sensation. We really wanted to push ourselves. And this is 2008, so we, we, we sent out and we said, any architects can design any jellies, just send us a design file, send us a scribble, a sketch, a napkin sketch, and um, well, we'll, we'll have good go at trying to make it for you. Um, and, and 2008 was just kind of before the economy was wobbling a little bit. Um, and uh, I think architects had quite a lot of time on their hands because they, they really mustered to the crime. We, we were overwhelmed. We found we had um, over a thousand entries to this architectural jelly competition. And, and some, were, some, were, some were really, well, some were really difficult to make. And this was Norman Foster's effort. Um, and it turns out that actually, um, Jelly bridges are uh, as hard to engineer as, as the, the blade of light. And we had to go back in and put some extra structure in and re-engineer it. And that was pretty hard at the time. But it came through. We'd never done a bridge again. Um, but this was uh, Roger Stark Carbon Partners design, which is amazing. It's really good. So does anyone know Bracas Airport in Madrid? So the, the wayfinding technique is all these colored pillars and what they did at Roger Sturt Carver and Partners is they keyed each one of those into a different jelly flavor. Um, and they're all like natural fruit. And the red ones are already good. You have some strawberries, cherries, raspberries. They had lots and lots to choose from. And then it gets, it gets harder and harder as you go along until you get into the blues. And there's not a lot of blue food. And at that point, I think they, they were just having fun. And they're just like, right, absinthe. Um, and we, we actually made it for the, for the architecture practice because we thought it was pretty awesome, and, and the absinthe ones were eaten first. Um, anyway. um, but then, because we, so we had so many different things, we thought it'd be really good to do something to celebrate all these brilliant entries and, and really push ourselves. And so we said, let's have an architectural jelly banquet and we'll have an exhibition of them. And um, we put tickets on sale, and we looked online, and, and suddenly we found that we'd sold 2,000 tickets, which was terrifying, all the more so because everyone was talking about this architectural jelly, it's what we'd called it. And they were imagining that we're going to make these enormous jellies the size of houses, that they could step inside and walk around. And as you see, jellies don't get very big. I mean, this is about the size we make them now. Um, they're pretty tiny. So we thought that all these thousands of people were going to mutiny and they were going to basically rip our throats out because um, they had they'd been promised a lot, um, which, which wasn't there. Um, so that's when we started really getting to grips with what you can do with events and giving people a great culinary experience with not a lot and not very much skill, um, but <laughs> using what you've got and working, working really hard on it. So, so what we had is we had an enormous long um, jelly table. To, to animate it, we had a waggle engine, which is an enormous lorry's um, windscreen wiper motor with a five kilogram weight on the bottom of it, so it wobbled back and forth. We worked with uh, an inner ear scientist to record the sound of jelly wobbling, which, um, and Anna Kirk Jim, I wasn't sure totally about the scientific um, 
For the of it, he was up for it. We went for it. It became New Scientist's most watched video for about three years. Um, but that was, <laughs> that was because I think it sounded like masturbation. Um, <laughs> it was pretty bewildering. But it was interesting. It starts off quite, quite, quite high, well, relatively high routes, Jelly. Um, but relatively, like, everyone's having a good look. And that's when we really learned the, the last laws of Jelly, which is when um, there's Jelly at 11 o'clock, at 11 o'clock, and so luckily I think we're all going to be out of here by 11 o'clock. It really kicks off. All the jelly is thrown everywhere, which doesn't normally matter, but if you're in a really lovely place like this, it could be, um, well, not something I want on my insurance anyway. Um, but, um, but then it, it sort of, so we had spoon dancers, and then, and then basically this is, we're trying to do a serious privacy thing for the very best jelly architect. Um, you can't really see it. You can see the glint of his spectacle there, because it's quite dark on the screen. Um, that's Heston Blumenthal was giving out the prize, the ultimate jelly architect. Um, but it was the witching hour, 11 o'clock. In they went into the jelly, and there's an enormous jelly wrestling. Um, and that's when you really learned a lot about events, that when you do an event and you have a couple thousand people, um, you really need to book a team to clean up. Um, <laughs> because everyone left, and it was um, myself and uh, my family. Um, <laughs> and, and I, I've been paying them back ever since, really, after they did it for five hours. Um, but I think, I think actually, that's, that's probably quite a good time to have a jelly. And, but I think uh, it was a real sort of trial by fire. And as you'll see in the, in the, final, the final section, that it really taught us that, um, you know, although food can be very small, if you apply the right techniques to it, and this can, this can be applicable for um, your home, home banquets, your barbecue, if the weather holds, hopefully, um, you can, you can give people quite wonderful um, culinary experiences with, without, um, and it's not that hard. Um, but anyway, so, so we're going to have to work as a bit of a team for passing these round. Um, and it's, it's one mouthful each, don't double dip, otherwise it'd be unhygienic. Um, <laughs> they are good though. So um, this one, this jelly, and uh, we've got a number of different jellying techniques. The golden rule if you're making jellies, one leaf, platinum leaf gelatin, to 100 ml of a liquid that you would like to taste Trust your own palate. You can all make jellies now. It's that, that's it. I mean, it took us a long time to work that out and a lot of failures. Um, so this is Prosecco elderflower um, marbled with violet pieces and berries. Um, so I can start there. There you go. And we'll get, some from, we'll get two from the very back coming up there as well. No, no fear. This, one, this one's a, a lovely one. This one's, this one's a stripey jelly. So it takes about two hours to set each stripe. So You've got to be committed if you're doing stripes. Um, but it's cam Campari and uh, orange. I'll take the reminder label off. Um, and, then, and then these ones for the back. Um, Beth, please can you help again? So we've got a, this one is a rose and rose blancmange and raspberry. Oh, thanks, Jack. Um, and this one, this one's just, this one's just a good one for Monday evening, pure Prosecco. Um, and some red currants. That, that, that would get you, get you going for uh, the, ne the next bit. The thing, thing that I found lovely, and, and this is great, is there's magic in every single ingredient. We found the magic in Jedi. It actually has this glorious culinary history, um, which I don't have time for today. Um, but if you, if you focus on the magic, it can, it can take you to wonderful places. So find that thing, and, and then off you go. So it's, um, yeah, so wedding, <laughs> some, some wonderful places. <laughs> So weddings, um, yeah, funerals, um, funeral homes, uh, jelly map of America for jello, um, fashion parties, um, more fashion. Um, that was Jellies as an art installation in, in San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and they said, would the artists like to talk about their work and make an artist statement? And we had to step back and say, no, the art will have to speak for itself. I don't think there was anything sensible we could possibly say about the jelly. Um, Jellies as explosions, and, and we finally worked out how to set a whole ship in jelly and make a really big architectural jelly, um, although that's another story um, <laughs> for the interval. Um, but anyway, so culinary philosophy, and you know, everyone had a spoon, and hopefully that's going around, pass it between the tables. Um, if not, I'll, I'll make one. I'll, actually, I don't want to promise that. There's an awful lot of people here. Um, I'll work something out by the end. Um, so once you've had a go, pass it round to the other tables, please, because we've got to make this, make this run. Um, anyway, so you should also have on the tables, um, you at the back might not have one, so you're going to have to be brave, sick bags. Um, 
because as we expound on the culinary philosophy, you might need it. Um, so we did, uh, on Friday night, um, an event called Journey to the Center of the Gut um, with the magnificent, brave, and wondrous uh, Gizzy Erskine. Um, I, was, I was up on stage with her, and, and I said, Gizzy, why, 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 why did you agree to do this? This is extraordinary. We gave her a pill cam, and she swallowed it in front of an audience, and then we played live jazz, uh, freeform jazz, along with it. It was, it was insane. It was really fun. We had a, we had a gastrointestinal... Um, uh, surgeon there pointing out, he was like the bus conductor, pointing out like the highlights of the human digestive tract as we went along. Um, and uh, Gizzy actually knocked it back to me, said, well, why did you ask you? And, and uh, the only answer was, like, I don't know anyone else who would possibly agree to something as bold um, in front of a live audience. It was, it was insane, but also brilliant. Um, but I'll, talk, I'll, I'll just play some of the footage from the pill cam. It's in her mouth at the moment, so you get glimpses of teeth. You'll know it when she swallows it, um, as we talk about our, our, our culinary philosophy. It's, it's pretty extreme. Um, anyway, so for us, we believe that everyone has an incredible palate. Here you can see Gizzy's incredible palate. But not everyone's able to be very articulate about it. Um, and also, everyone's palate is incredibly different. So about 10% of people cannot trace taste the really unctuous, brilliant things, compelling um, smells that make truffles so wonderful. Actually, no, it's not that. It's 40%. So when you sit around a, uh, a table this big, there might be four people when you're having this wonderful, expensive truffle dish that are umming and ahhing and ooing and ahhing over just the expense of it alone. They're not really getting the good thing. And I, I, I suspect I'm one of them. Um, but um, on the flip side of that, um, so everyone's got an amazing palate. Um, but they're just not very good at articulating it, and they're very, very good with their eyes. Your, your, your visual cortex processes things 10 times faster than your olfactory and taste cortex. So if you think about when we talk about right, giving directions to the shop, that's it, I'm fucking out. Um, uh, give me, it's always like, right, you go to the traffic lights, turn uh, left at the hot dog sign, and you get to where your destination is, um, rather than go to traffic lights, smell the hot dogs, and turn left. So what you need to do is address your, you know, the food has to be good, don't get me wrong, um, but as hot tips, address the sense of vision. Um, and so that's really what we do, given that we, we you know, really turbocharge that. The food's got to be good, because we, we do these dinners for people, and, um, you know, we'll see tickets go out online, it'll be a hundred pounds or something extraordinary, I'd, I'd never pay that for, for a meal. Um, and you see people tweeting, and they're going, going for a meal at Bombson Park, going to be the best dinner of my life. And you sit there, and you think about all the best, actual best dinners of your life, and all the different things that have to go into that. You have to have the right people around the table. They have to not hate each other on that particular evening. Um, they're, and they're just, there's so many things that contribute to it, and just the cooking alone is not, is not really enough to do it. So for now, we try and go for total sensory assault, um, which is... Make a room look great. I've got loads of stats about what this will do to your palate if you go into a golden room. It'll taste literally brilliant. It doesn't really matter what you eat in, in, in that scenario. Um, uh, you've got to put, put food on the table that everyone can recognize and get. When you go to restaurants and they're blobs and smir smir actually, not always, don't always do that, but as a centerpiece, it's pretty bloody good. It costs you five pounds, and if you whack it in the oven for two hours, it doesn't really matter how hot the oven is, um, there's guaranteed to be one bit of meat which is perfectly well cooked um, somewhere in there. It's such a big mass. Great table centerpiece. So we do lovely golden pig's heads. You're, and most, most accommodating butchers will fish one up for you. Um, weight staff, I don't have time for this. Um, it's a bodybuilder with burgers. Um, but also have a trick up your sleeve. And this is, this is a final, the final element as well. Um, and so what, what we've got, this is actually a little bit dangerous. Um, and it's coming back to the thing that every single um, ingredient can be really wondrous. So here for you tonight, I've got some humble gherkins. That, and these ones actually are gherkins with wild garlic and red peppers. Um, but anyway, what, we're, what I'm going to do is we found out that actually, if you put a load of currants across a gherkin, it um, conducts sodium D-line. Uh, well, sorry, it, so it basically arcs across the gherkin with extreme current. Um, 
And when we found out about that, we got hold of an electrician. We said, this is really exciting. What can we do with it? And he said, nothing on my watch. And we're like, okay, well, what if we, what if you don't sign it off and you just experiment and tell us what, what we need to do? So he worked out that each one of these little gherkins, one of, well, actually a small gherkin draws about 300 watts of power. A large gherkin draw, and these are large ones, draws 500 watts of power um, when you plug it into the mains. So it's probably not best on a metal thing. Um, <laughs> Anyway, um, and what you can do with a gherkin is just turn it into a really, really crap light bulb for about three seconds. So that's what, that's what we're going to do now. Um, so we're gonna do, if we do a countdown from three, um, and then I'm gonna plug it in, and um, we'll, we'll watch the pickles go. Can we actually take the, make the spotlight down? Great, okay, we ready? Three. Two, one. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you very much. And the, the fine. So even the most humble ingredients harbour magic. We made a we made a gherkin. That was two two lots three phase power. When we were working on that, we had to strap the plugs to our body because there's a real, like, if you went near it, you died, basically, to just stop someone plugging them in when we're working. Um, and then the final bit is um, getting people out of a room um, or clearing a party, which is always really hard. Um, and what, this, is, this is what we like to do for it, which is our, our pineapple cigarette holder. Um, and we just trade these out around a really good party, and everyone, even the, even the non-smokers, are so fascinated by it, they, like, follow this thing outside and then we just lock the doors, and um, that's it. Party's over. We can start cleaning up. So I think that's a great time um, to have a break. And thank you very much for your time.